then we're going to be introducing you to a new song. It's called Graves into Gardens. And before you sing it, and you're like, well, what is this about? There's a part in it that says, you turn graves into gardens. And what that means is that the Lord is able to resurrect that which was dead, to bring life out of a bad situation. It also says, you turn bones into armies. And that uh, comes from Ezekiel, where that valley of dry bones, it said, Lord, can these bones live? The Spirit of God brings the life into dead things. And then it says, you turn seas into highways. And that reminds us of the parting of the Red Sea that God did in the Exodus when he brought the children of uh, Israel from Egypt into the Promised Land. And so as we get ready to sing that today, let's remember that God is our deliverer. God is the one that brings life out of death. God is the one that turns graves into gardens today. Let's pray. God, we look to you this morning. As we come to worship you, Lord, we just pray that we would set aside everything from the past that is, Lord, keeping us down, weighing us down. Lord, we pray for those that are here today, those who are watching online, and those who are outside, Lord, that I pray that you would be the lifter of their burdens today. Lord, help us to sing a new song. Let's celebrate what you've done in our lives and hearts and look to you for our future. May your peace and may your presence be upon this place this morning as we worship you. Jesus' name, amen. Turn shame into glory. You're the only one. 
darkest before the dawn. Sometimes it seems like that there's no answer in sight and no break or relief. But I hope that this song will remind you that even when things are bleak and dark, the Lord is still able to come to your rescue and your intervention when you need it. Every war he wages, he will win. 
I'm not backing down from any giant. I know how this story ends. Yes, I know how this story ends. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. Oh, the battle belongs to you. I'm going to Turn it for good. You take.
in a man's way, he makes his steps firm. Though he stumble, he will not fall. For the Lord upholds him with his hand. I was young, and now I am old. Yet, I have never seen the righteous forsaken or their children begging bread. They are always generous and lend freely their children will be blessed. The salvation of the righteous comes from the Lord. He is their stronghold in time of trouble. The Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Lord, this morning, we need to take refuge in you. This morning, Lord, we need to know that we're in the palm of your hand. Many of us face very serious things. Many of us have loved ones that are facing very serious things. They are in battles for their very lives, Lord. And our hearts break this morning for the ones that we love for the ones that we cannot heal, for the ones that we cannot provide an answer. But Lord, how blessed are we that we can tell them that you have the answer, that you have the 
healing, that you are the one who brings victory in battle, just like we sang this morning, Lord. You are the one that fights for us. So this morning, Lord, we just, we lift up our hands knowing that there's nothing that we can do, that there are so many things that are out of our control. of your word. Thank you, Father, that you have given us, Jesus, the living word. Make your word alive to us today, Lord. If it needs to cut and break away things that are not supposed to be part of us, we give you permission today to do that. For your word is a sharp and two-edged sword. Father, make us more like Jesus in every way. Keep us focused on those things that are most important, Lord. May your word transform us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, Living Hope. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here this morning. We do appreciate you all showing up today. It's so important to continue to meet, to worship our God together, so we thank you for being here. Uh, for those of you brave enough outside, we welcome you as well. Uh, go ahead and anchor yourselves down. It's a little breezy out there. Uh, but if you don't want to stay outside and wish to go to your car, you can listen to the service if you tune in to 87.9 FM on your car radio. And for those of you joining us online as well, we welcome you and pray that you'll be blessed by joining us today. Uh, our mandatory safety measures, we'll just review that we are still practicing social distancing, wearing masks at all times. 
Uh, there's no food or drink during the service, uh, no coffee hour after, but please stay for a time of fellowship and prayer outside after the service. Uh, we just want to thank everyone who participated in our thank a teacher effort. Uh, we collected uh, gift cards and we were able to deliver 55 gift cards to the teachers of Powderbill Middle School. Yeah. And I'm sure they're very appreciative of that. So uh, thank you for participating. It's so important for us to continue to reach out to our community, especially in this tough time. Uh, if you haven't been joining us, or if you have been joining us, please continue to do so for our Revelation study. It's been wonderful with Pastor Dan and Alan. I would thank them both. You guys have been doing a great job. It's been very informative. Um, that's on our Facebook and also our YouTube channel. Uh, it premieres Wednesday night at 6.30 and then you can tune in any time after that to watch the study. Uh, we have missions convention coming up. That's actually next week, October 18th. That begins through November 1st. We have three speakers lined up for that, so please join us for that. Um, we are putting together a cookbook, and uh, today is the deadline for the submission. So if you have anything at all, it, it doesn't even matter what it is. If it was something that you're going to bring to the missions dinner, and it's very simple, just jot it down for us and uh, hand it off to Dan Sousa, and he'll compile that into a cookbook for us. Uh, it's the second Sunday of the month, and we focus on missions, so we're going to have the Sherlands come on up for the Missions Minute. And I have to thank Dan for taking up the uh, challenge of putting together the cookbook for us, and um, also he's helping me with some video work for missions, so... Thank God for him. Um, so seriously, it can be macaroni and cheese. I don't even care. Just let's get a cookbook. Please. I just submitted mine because I was delinquent as well. So follow my example and get it in today. So um, what we want to focus on today is uh, UMass Amherst Chi Alpha and the Freedom Cafe. And the reason why I'm bringing it up, um, not because we haven't talked about them before, but because um, in light of COVID, UMass really does not have anywhere near the number of students on campus that they normally do. But the number that are there will be mostly foreign students who are allowed to live on campus in the campus housing. And I think it's really interesting how God uniquely ordained for those specific people to be on the campus in the United States in Amherst, Mass, despite a pandemic. And there's a reason for that. It's because God wants to reach into their lives. And the way he does it is through a twofold ministry, which is really unique. And one of the things is the coffee house, which is the Freedom Cafe, so you're going to hear about that. Um, but that ties into the campus ministry of Chi Alpha because people are touched and drawn to the coffee house, not because it's overtly Christian or anything, but then once they're there, God reaches into their heart and connects them to the ministry where they can learn about him and his love, and it's really <clears throat> quite unique. So I wanted you to get this uh, snapshot today. So you're exciting, because uh, you came to the Freedom Cafe before you came to Kyle. Mm -hmm. yeah. So tell us about that a little bit. Um, so I don't remember, I think it was um, Leona who mm -hmm. had a uh, just like a poster or like some sort of like card on her door. Yeah. Um, and we were like neighbors in freshman year. And it was really interesting. I, I asked her about it and she was like talking to me about the Freedom Cafe. Yeah. And I mean, I love the reception and tremendous like song. So yeah. I just dropped in one day yeah. and I just really love the space. So I just started really to like engage with the music mm -hmm. and I really love the Freedom Cafe. few months after I started volunteering, like, you told me about Chi Alpha, mm -hmm. and I was definitely, like, looking for a community yeah, yeah. then, like, mm -hmm. I had bounced around like, different communities, like, Christian communities in UMass, and they were all, like, great, but I just didn't really find one that I felt like I could belong to and, like, grow in, so, yeah, I came to Chi Alpha through that, That's and cool. it's been good, it's been kind of a slow journey, like, 
but it's yeah. been it's been a really good time. Yeah. So, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Have you had any good like spiritual conversations with people while at the Prim Cafe? It just happens. I mean, so many times. I mean, I I can think of so many examples right now. Like even people on Christian just like, talking about like the mission and like, how we connected to mm -hmm. the gospel and stuff like yeah. that. So yeah, it's been good. I've Keep up. Really cool people. Yeah. Like, so we the Freedom is kind of in the hub of yes. your spiritual. I would say, so, especially last year, like I I met a lot of like interesting people that like I. Like, it's not Dan's like, fault. So we've the Freedom Cafe has kind of been the hub of your yes. spiritual. I would say so, especially community. last year. Like I feel like I met a lot of like interesting people that like I like wouldn't have met otherwise. Like from just different Christian communities on campus, like Crew and IV, and so yeah, it's been a good time. <laughs> What is your, have you talked to your uh, parents about Freedom Cafe? Oh yeah, I do, <laughs> they know. They know that I'm like here all the time. Oh good. Yeah. Um, they get the bill, you know, <laughs> they get the credit card, so. Yeah. So it's Freedom Cafe. Yeah. Um, definitely, like, I mean, they, I just like love telling them about like coming here and like hanging out here. And um, I mean, they think the mission is really cool. Yeah, um, yeah, I've told them about it. They, they love like the idea. So in the areas that you've grown in your faith mm -hmm. and um, in the area of mission that the Freedom Cafe represents, yeah. how has that impacted what you're going to do after college? Whoa, that's a big one. really good question. Um, I mean, I've always been interested in like, you know, this kind of like nonprofit like space and like social justice and stuff yeah. even before I got here, but I think like seeing this so tangibly, like something that, you know, maybe not, it's just like a very untraditional kind of, I guess, nonprofit like charity thing. Cause it's like, it's a cafe run by volunteers. It's so yeah. interesting. And so I guess it like shows me like different ways in which you can be involved That's in true. that space. Um, and I don't necessarily have like a concrete like plan for after graduation, which is so scary. But yeah. like, it's definitely like showing me that there's so many possibilities. But it broadens, yeah, it broadens what you think. It definitely does. I mean, that's kind of what happened. That's how we started. Yeah. Is, I'd never seen it done before, but I'm a I'm someone who likes building and creating things. And yeah. So uh, I had no experience with coffee or business, but why not? Exactly. You know, why yeah. not start something and um, you know, make it a mission, make it a ministry. So um, all he had to say was yes. He had no experience with coffee or a business, but he said, yes, Lord, where do you need me? And that's what happened. And so I think that's a lesson for all of us. And um, I want to hand it over to Brian. We do need to pray for Shane and his family. They're dealing with some fraudulent charges in their account, and he said it's a nightmare. So if we could pray against that. And then also one of their pets is dying. So, you know, they have life just like we have life. So we need to pray um, for them. That is so good. He works in so many different and mysterious ways, things that we don't necessarily even think of until he brings it to our mind. And uh, just so grateful for the opportunities to, to serve and minister through uh, through our outreaches and our our uh, missionaries, etc. cetera. Uh, if you're giving towards missions in addition to your tithe, um, certainly mark that on your check uh, so that we know. Uh, there's four ways to give. You can uh, throw an envelope in the box in the back. You can... Uh, give online through our website, and there's also text uh, to give and mobile giving through, uh, through our Venmo account. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity again to reach out through, through your ministries, Lord. We lift up our missionaries specifically this week for, for, uh, the Chi Alpha Ministries and and for their leadership and and for their family also, Lord, that you would just touch their 
daily life situations that that you would be there for them that you would be glorified through the solutions and and uh just lift it up lord in jesus name thank you for the gifts now and the givers in jesus name amen You with me today? Can you hear me all right? Huh. Yeah, I know. It's kind of a sleepy sort of weekend, isn't it? So stay with me on this. Well, I'm glad that you decided to come today, and certainly those of you who decided to join us uh, on this uh, extended three-day weekend. So appreciate you worshiping with us and being with us today. It means a lot um, to see your faces. It means a lot to see you here worshiping together. Um, that's a, it's a blessing. It really is. And so thank you for being here today. As Art mentioned, and we say again thank you to those of you who donated to uh, the Thank a Teacher effort. As he mentioned before, we were able to give 55 uh, gift cards to teachers at the Powder Mill School. And uh, you'd still like to make a donation towards that. We were able to bring in about 36 of them. So if you still wanted to make a donation towards that, you know, you can do that and we would appreciate it. I also want to mention, of course, next uh, week starts our missions convention, so we'll be kicking that off. It's Kevin Zarika, and uh, you'll be hearing about uh, what the missionaries are doing both locally and globally, and so I hope that you'll start to think about uh, missions and also think about like, what you can do in terms of giving towards missions. You know, the uh, pandemic's affected a lot of people's economics, and uh, missionaries are no different, so we want to continue to support them and the work that they do. Normally I'd be speaking from the book of Acts this morning, but I felt led of the Lord to take a little detour. And uh, if you've ever been on a road trip, sometimes it's nice to be able to have the freedom to take a detour and go somewhere else. And so we're going to do that this morning, and so the little detour we're going to go on is in Matthew chapter 13. Um, but before I do that, I want to ask you the question, and you don't have to answer it, it's more rhetorical than anything else. What is the most valuable thing in your life right now? What is the most valuable thing in your life right now? If I were to ask you, what do your priorities look like? Because whatever is valuable to us is uh, shaped by our priorities revolve around whatever is the most valuable. And so looking at that, you know, if someone were to ask you as a Christian, what are the priorities in your life? Number one, number two, number three. And maybe you can do that little exercise right now. Like, what are the most important things in your life, write them down. Number one, number two, number three. And uh, it varies uh, depending on who you're talking to. Uh, if you were to ask me, of course, the, the typical response is number one, God's always first, right? And you would think that number two would be the church, but it, actually it's my family, believe it or not, because 
Uh, if you look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, the qualifications for an overseer, a bishop, or a deacon are that he must manage his own family well, and if he doesn't manage his family well, he has really no business managing God's church. So as I fulfill the second one, it actually helps me with the first one. And number three, of course, is the church and, and work. And that might differ for you depending on where you're coming from or where you're approaching things, but what are the most important things in your life? Because based on your priorities, your decisions revolve around that. And what we say is important is not nearly as important as what we actually do and actually act upon as important. I believe we're living in a time where as we look at Christianity as a whole, as we look at the church as a whole, uh, we are coming at a time where uh, Christians and their, their devotion towards God is wavering, and their commitment to him has become lukewarm at best. Part of the reason why I'm sitting for this message is any time I feel like I'm going to bring you something that might sound a little harsh, I like to sit so that it doesn't look like I'm trying to tell you what to do. Uh, because I recognize that we all need to learn from the Lord, and there's times where we need to take instruction from him, uh, myself included. So there are times where I preach to myself. So we're looking at a time, especially in the world we're living in, where Christianity as a whole is wavering, people's belief in God is struggling. We see at times, too, that uh, attending church becomes optional. Bible reading is infrequent. And times of prayer are cold, stale, and dry, if they even happen at all. So I believe God wants to bring us back to a place where he is the most important and most valuable thing to us in our lives, and that our lives reflect that truth. As I mentioned earlier, we're going to be taking a little bit of a detour, and the detour is going to be in Matthew chapter 13. So if you want to turn there, you can. It's very short. We're going to be looking at just two verses today. And then we're going to be looking at some other verses to support it. But we're looking at verses 44 through 46. This is one of Jesus' many parables in chapter 13 about the kingdom. And so Jesus says this in Matthew 13. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy he, uh, over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. So you can underline that sold all that he had to buy that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls who, when he had found a pearl of great price, went on, sold all that he had, and bought it. Now, before you think this is a giving message where I'm going to tell you that you need to sell all you have and give it away, it's not that at all. We're not talking about money today. Instead, we're talking about our heart. We're talking about where we're coming from. We're talking about, does God really mean as much to us as we say he does? Is he as valuable to us as we claim? Do, do our decisions, the way that we spend our time, the way that we give of our talent, the way that we serve, the way that we worship, does it reflect a life that is truly set apart for God and God alone? In Matthew 13, we see a picture of two men uh, one who is working in the field and found the treasure, and one who is actively seeking fine pearls. Some observations from this text. Number one, first thing is that it was a hidden treasure. It was not easily found. And I'm reminded that when Jesus spoke in parables, the meaning wasn't always clear to those listening to it. The, there would be many times that Jesus would say, let him who has an ear, let him hear and that there would be people that would listen to parables and think that it was just a nice story, an entertaining story, but there's a spiritual truth that is communicated through it. There is a communication about the way that God is, about what the kingdom of heaven is like, which incidentally, that's something that we should all strive for and want to be able to be part of the kingdom of heaven, not only here on this earth, but also eternally as well, that we shouldn't just simply think of this life as all there is. And if so, 2020 would be depressing if this was all that life was. When you think about these last few months, it's, it's got to be more than this. And eternity is a reminder that there is more to this and more than we could ever imagine or hope for. There's a hidden treasure. It had to be sought for. 
It had to be looked for. It had to be understood. The other part is that he was looking for it. He was looking for something of value and meaning. And especially as we look at this world today, people are looking for something that has value and meaning. And that is ever-changing in the culture that we live in, in the times that we're living in right now, with the economics changing so often, people who thought they had a job and a reliable source of income are all of a sudden seeing that job disappear, and all of a sudden they're finding themselves without job, without work, without purpose. There are times where difficulties have come into the family situation. Uh, these last few months have create a strain on marriages where some marriages have, are on the brink of ending because mom and dad or husband and wife realize that uh, the time apart from each other was actually good and that when they're together, they really actually don't like each other at all. And then you have problems with children and abuses towards children. And so we have a, a crumbling family dynamic and people are looking for something of value and of meaning, something of lasting importance. And we need that more than ever today. Both men searched where they knew or thought they might be able to find it. You see, a, a merchant would go through the marketplace and look for that uh, valuable pearl. And when he had found it, he would give all that he had towards it. He knew where to look for it. There's a value in seeking and finding in God's kingdom. We see that repeatedly through scripture. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Matthew 6, says, seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all of these things will be added unto you. Concerning prayer, Matthew 7, verse 8, Jesus said, that everyone who asks receives, everyone who seeks finds, and everyone who knocks, the door will be open to him. So there's this active element where if we want to know God more, if we want to go deeper with him, we have to actively seek and look for him, and he'll be found by us. When these men found this treasure, when they found the pearl, they realized what they had and they cherished it. I'm always amazed at, you know, what's valuable to us is not always valuable to someone else. You know, I'm a person that collects different things, and I'm always proud to show off the collection of things I have. But it's always interesting to me that what I consider to be valuable or interesting or enjoyable is not always appreciated by somebody else. So whether you collect baseball cards or coins or Beanie Babies or whatever the case might be, sometimes you'll show it to somebody and they're just kind of unimpressed. They're kind of like, well, that's nice. And then they move on to something else. Or maybe you've entrusted something valuable to someone only to recognize that they either break it or don't return it. I realized as a pastor a long time ago, I stopped loaning out books because I never got it back. And you never read it anyway. So, you know, when people ask to borrow a book or have a book, I just order you the book on Amazon and have it shipped to you because I just know I'll never see that again. So it's always funny to, to recognize that when you think about something that's valuable, if it's valuable to you, you cherish it, you hold it close, and you keep it near and dear to your heart. The man who found this treasure, the man who found this pearl of great price. There are two different men here we're talking about, but the man who found the pearl recognized that the value of this pearl would be life-changing. Think about it for a moment, is that this man finds a pearl in a field and recognizes that it's worth enough to buy the whole field. Like, we're not talking about, like, okay, a pearl that might be, you know, a single pearl on a necklace. There must have been something about this pearl that was more valuable than the field that he bought to make him want it so much. Now, we don't know how large this pearl was, but it's clear that it's valuable enough to the man that he wanted it, and he was willing to pay a great price for it. Now, the largest pearl ever found, I don't know if you knew this or not, but the largest pearl ever found, Philippine officials believe they may have recovered the largest natural giant clam pearl in the world, a whopping 34 kilograms, the pearl was found 10 years ago by a fisherman who was unaware of its value and kept it as a good luck charm under its bed. 
34 kilograms, and our resident uh, economist, Arnie, will correct me if I get the measurements wrong. 34 kilograms is 75 pounds. So a 75 pound pearl, which was kind of shaped like the clams inside, those giant clams inside, but it was so valuable that it went at auction for $100 million. That's a life-changing value right there. To find that, that's a life-changing find, that this fisherman went from just being a common, everyday fisherman to being a millionaire in a very short period of time. That's life-changing value. And yet it pales in comparison to the value that you have in Christ for how much can a person give in exchange for his eternal soul? You can't buy your way into heaven. Or one might read these verses and think that it's us who pays the price to receive salvation, but that's not the case. So this, this passage is not about earning your way into heaven. This passage is not about buying your way into eternity. But rather we see a picture and a symbol that Christ wants us to get a hold of, that the pearl and the treasure are symbolic of salvation that's only found in Jesus Christ. So when we're talking about the value of salvation, it was already paid for by Jesus on the cross. James Montgomery Boyce writes, notice that the merchant stopped seeking pearls when he found the pearl of great price. Eternal life, the incorruptible inheritance, and the love of God through Christ constitute the pearl which once found makes further searching unnecessary. Christ fulfills our greatest needs, satisfies our longing, and makes us whole and clean before God, calms and quiets our hearts, and gives us hope for the future. Now, when was the last time you looked at your salvation that way? Some of us are just holding on to salvation by a thread, not realizing that to do so would to give up on our faith, to give up on God, to abandon our trust and hope in Christ would be like giving up the greatest treasure that could ever come across your possession ever. Greater than any inheritance that your relatives could leave you or an uncle, long lost uncle could bequeath to you or that someone might give to you by winning the lottery. What you have in Christ is valuable not only for this life, but for the life to come. It's not a fire insurance policy to keep you from going to hell. It's meant for you to understand your great worth to God and the great price that he paid for us. So in a moment, if you question your salvation, if you question the goodness of God, all you should be able to do is to reflect on what God has done for us in Christ Jesus to recognize the great value our salvation has. He paid the price for us, and the price he paid was great. A terrible, horrible death on the cross. He paid the price that we might have eternal life. So he paid the price for salvation, and then we pay the price of following him by giving up everything that we have. Notice that the man and the merchant in these two verses of scripture sold all that they had to get that pearl, to get that treasure. So what then is the price we pay? The price that we pay is after we've found salvation. It's what we choose to give up to hold on to it, and to hold it dearly. Once we've received the grace of God in our lives, it should change everything about us. Listen to me, being a Christian is not something that you do, it's who you are. Being a Christian, I, I don't do Christianity. I don't do religion. Christ, uh, being a Christian is who I am. Being a follower of Christ is who I am. And there are times where that's challenging and it's not always easy. There's times where it's incredibly difficult, no matter what age you are. Whether you've been a Christian five years or whether you've served God your entire life, there are things that come down the road at you, whether it be the death of a loved one, a divorce, loss of a job, the, the chronic illness that you might have or the sickness of a child, any of those things that you face immediately challenge the faith that you have and the salvation you hold so dearly. But being a Christian is not something you do. It's who you are. This means that Jesus is at the center of all of your convictions and all of your decisions. 
The first question you must ask yourself in every situation we presented an opportunity, when presented with a decision to make, the, question, the first question you should ask yourself is, does this honor God? Will this honor Jesus? Will this contribute to my testimony or detract from my testimony as a follower of Jesus? And let the answer to that question be the answer for every other question. If we put him at the center, if he's at the focus, then it takes care of everything else. So there's a cost involved. So what is the cost? The cost of following Jesus is something that Jesus himself spoke about. It's about giving up everything to follow him. Now the problem is we try and have this kind of joint custody of our life with God. That it's Jesus and we also want to say in everything. It's us and it's someone else, you know? It's, it's us and God. But we want to say, okay, Lord, uh, I appreciate that you're leading and guiding me and you're answering the prayer I prayed about following you and giving me direction, but I have some thoughts on your plan for me. I have some improvements, some suggestions, some things that you might take under advisement because I feel like this is my life and I have some say to that. Understand today that when you choose to follow Jesus... He's not your advisor. He's not a consultant that you look to. But rather, he is Lord and he is Savior. That means what he wants is what I do, even if I don't understand it, even if I can't comprehend it, even if I don't think it's the right direction. What's the cost? The cost, you know, there's a cost involved to seek his kingdom and purposes first. So what is the price? Let's look at these, uh, the price as we look at what Jesus had to say about counting the cost. Number one, what is the price? The cost of comfort is the first thing. The cost of comfort. We like being comfortable, don't we? I don't know about you, but there's nothing better than a comfortable chair, a comfortable recliner, a comfortable bed, a good night's sleep. We like comfort. We like job security. We don't like uncertainty. We like comfort and familiarity in situations, in our home, in our relationships. So we like being comfortable. But Jesus had this to say about the cost of following him. In Luke 9, 23 through 25, Jesus said to them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? Think about that. Is that you have to be willing to take up your cross. Now, that picture, remember, this is before Jesus went to the cross. This is before Jesus died and rose again. So this is a very confusing phrase for disciples to listen to because up until this point, everyone who died on the cross was a criminal. Everyone who died on the cross deserved to die. So when Jesus is saying, take up your cross and follow him, that must have been an incredibly confusing statement for someone who is following Jesus. But what's the path on that? The path is death. The path is sacrifice. The path is giving up. So there is an element to this relationship with God that I have to give up the things that I consider to be essential and important to me in order to have salvation and in order to follow him truly in the way he desires for me to follow him. And all of a sudden it's like, yikes. This is a little bit more than you might have thought it was. It's kind of like applying for a job and recognizing as the interview goes on that you are in no way qualified to have this job. It's like recognizing that as they start to talk about responsibilities and start asking you questions to things that you don't have the answer for, that you realize this is bigger than I thought it was. There's more to it than I initially thought. Later in that same chapter in Luke 9, verses 57 through 62, it says, Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I'll follow you. Wherever you go, and Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Then he said to another, follow me, but the man said, let me go and bury my father first. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. 
And another said, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now you might read this and think Jesus is being really difficult here. Like, Jesus, people want to follow you. So what's the problem? Like, why do you got to be so difficult about it? Why do you got to be harsh about it? And the truth is that in each situation, Jesus was addressing something that the people were comfortable with, that he was making clear to them it wasn't going to be like they thought it was going to be. So when the man says, you know, Jesus, I'll follow you anywhere, and he's like, just so you know, I'm essentially homeless. I basically travel, I'm an itinerant preacher, I stay in people's homes, I don't own any property, there's no uh, compound, there's no training facility, there's no, like, you know, intern program for you to come here. So understand that if you're going to follow me, that you're going to basically be in a place where you're going to be without. And I don't think that that man decided to follow Jesus. And then two men who seem like they have legitimate reasons, it's like, like, you know, Jesus, I have to bury my father. Jesus, I just want to say goodbye to my family. And it was clear to the Lord that, like, they were comfortable with a particular situation in life he said, if you're going to have to choose between those two things, if you're more comfortable there, just stay there. Don't, don't follow me because it's hard. It's challenging. It's difficult. And I don't think the Lord's trying to be difficult. He just wanted them to know that following him was not going to be easy or comfortable. The second cost is the cost of conflict, number two. Cost of conflict. Matthew 10, 34 through 4, 39. And let me read that to you. And this is a perplexing passage of scripture. Because we have to understand that like the same Jesus that's love and grace and, and, and power and might is also a, 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 the Lord that has expectations of us. And so as we look at Matthew 10, verses 34, it says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword, for I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's enemies will be those in his own household. He who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and he who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me, and he who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. What an odd statement from Jesus. But he wasn't saying that he's intentionally causing divisions in family, but that rather the fact that his faith in Jesus would naturally cause division. That his, him coming into the family dynamic would cause tension and difficulty, discord, there'd be disagreements. So I'll give you an example. Okay, if he's preaching to mostly Jewish believers at this point in time, and there were a lot of Jews that did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah or that he was the Son of God. In fact, for him to claim to be the Son of God was they considered blasphemous. So if someone decided to become a Christian and come to Jesus, it usually meant that they were excommunicated from the synagogue and kicked out of the temple. And in the community, if that happened to you, people didn't associate with you. They didn't do business with you. They didn't maintain friendships. They didn't uh, you know, have anything to do with you. Uh, when it came to your own family as well, it meant that sometimes what happened to you would affect the entire family. So when we see the man that was born blind in, in the Gospel of John, and he's brought before the Sanhedrin, and then he calls his parents together and says, you know, is this your son who was born blind and now is healed? And they say, ask him, he's of age. Because they recognize they didn't want to be cast out of the synagogue. So understand that to be a Christian in a Jewish household meant that you could be excommunicated from the community. It meant that you could be barred from temple worship. It meant that your family would not associate with you. And so Jesus was saying to them is that me, my, faith in me, hope in me would be a source of division in your own household. And if your being okay with your family was more important than that, then you're forfeiting salvation. Wow, that's challenging. And I always had difficulty with this. Like, what do you mean I have to love them more than my, my own, uh, you know, father and mother, and love them more than my son or daughter? What does that mean? How, I can't possibly know what it's like to love someone more than that. You know, I, I love my family who I've seen. It's hard to love God whom I haven't seen. 
And then I realized that the, the, the realization here is that if it came down to choosing between my family and my faith, I have to choose my faith because that's enduring. And I pray for my family and I intercede for my family and I, and I continue to share with my family, not this family, but they're all on board with this. They, you know, Stephanie, Nate, and Erica, they're all on board. I don't have to preach to my family. But my extended family is like, you've got to recognize that my responsibility is still to, to present Christ. And if they don't like it, if they reject it, if they're hostile towards it, it doesn't mean I go, well, I guess this didn't work out. And hope that it all turns out for the best. My faith at times will bring me into conflict with family. It will sometimes bring me into conflict with friends, coworkers, others, especially in an election year. My goodness, right? Conflict because of what you believe and what you hold on to. But that shouldn't deter you from giving your life for the Christ and the faith that you have. The third cost is the cost of commitment. The cost of commitment. It says that these men gave up everything. The men who found uh, the treasure and the pearl were grateful when they found it and they sold everything that they had to acquire it. They knew that what they had was worth it. And can I say that today, too? What you have in Christ is worth it. What you have in him is worth it. Do you view your salvation that way? That no matter what you're going through, it's worth it. Because of what you stand to gain on the other side. You know, it's funny, too, because the scripture talks about wills and inheritance and all of those things when it comes to you know, salvation. But you realize that in order to receive inheritance, somebody has to die, right? So there's Christ who died for us and his covenant, his will and testament to us is that we receive all the benefits of salvation and eternal life and God's favor upon us through his death. Coincidentally, how do we achieve and receive these blessings? Through dying to ourselves. Jesus said that, right? Twice he said, take up your cross and follow me. So there is the idea of dying to self. We didn't buy our salvation, only Jesus did that, but the cost of following Jesus is indeed great. Can I challenge you today to count the cost? There is no cheap grace today when it comes to God. Part of the reason why so many people treat their relationship with God so casually is because it didn't cost them anything in the first place. You know, they come to salvation not understanding their sin, not understanding what Jesus did for them. So when it comes to commitment, when it comes to appreciation, it just, you ever wonder why you lead somebody to Christ and you're so excited for them, and yet they go off and do something else? It's because they never really understood what they were getting and what they were giving up in the first place. That's why making sure that they are truly understanding the decision they're making, one, and then number two, that you're discipling them and raising them up in the true faith and working into them uh, a firm foundation so that they understand what exactly I have. If salvation to you is just that God loved me and that's it, then it will always be treated as something that's second class and unimportant. Well, every, you know, everybody loves me. I'm great. But if you understand that God loved you in spite of you, God loved you in spite of your sin, your failures, your shortcomings, and that what he did on the cross for you, how he died a painful and horrible death so that you might have life. He didn't have to, but he did. When you see it that way, it should change the way that you look at your salvation. Cheap grace is when you don't give up anything to follow Jesus. Cheap grace is when you decide to follow Jesus and at the first sign of trouble or inconvenience or saying something that you don't like, you decide to do something else because, ah, this is not what I thought. Can I encourage you today, have the courage to stand by your convictions and to stand for Christ. When Jesus called the first disciples, the, their in, it comes to their decision, it was immediate and there was no indecisiveness. There was no hesitation. When Jesus called the first disciples, the, the men that he chose as the 12, they didn't go, well, let me think about it for a while. Or say, let me pray about it and then never really get back to them, which is sometimes what we do as Christians. Let me pray about it, which means no. If we just don't want to say no. Let our yes be yes and our no be no. If you don't want to do it, just say, Pastor, I don't have the time for it. I can't do it. But saying you pray about it and never getting back to somebody, that's just, 
You're just avoiding the question. That's a side note, anyway. But when Jesus called the first disciples in Matthew 4, verses 18 through 22, it's clear they knew what was going on. It's clear they knew what they were getting into. Take a look at verse 18. It says, As Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. And they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for men. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in the boat with their father Zebedee, preparing the nets. And Jesus called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed him. Think about that. These guys had a family business. They were with their father. And the dad's probably like, where do you think you're going? It's like, the master wants us. Jesus wants us to follow him. And they knew what they were doing. They knew who was talking to them. They knew that the man that was speaking to them was someone special. And they knew that what they stood to gain was greater than anything they could possibly lose. Do you look at salvation that way? Do you look at your love for God that way? That what I stand to gain is greater than anything I could lose in this life. If you do, it'll change the way you look at your faith. Jesus also gave him the promise that anyone who has left family, land, or property will not fail to receive that much in the kingdom that is to come. So let me ask you a question. What is your most prized possession? What is the thing that you value most? What is the thing that you care about and that you love more than anything else? You know, when you think about it and you consider where we go and where we walk to from there, you know, the things that are valuable to us tend to be in the most prominent of places, don't they? You don't take something that's valuable and you say, well, you know, that's important to me, but you don't show it off. You don't display it. Instead, it's usually in a place where everyone can see. So if it's your most prized possession, think about it this way. Is it your family? If it's your family, if you truly care about them, you love them, where do you find the signs of your love and affection? If you love your family, it's probably demonstrated through the pictures on your wall, pictures on your mantle place. You know, the awkward pictures from school that your kids hate. You're 15 years old and you still have them up on the wall when you had braces and a bad haircut. But mom and dad love that because it reminds them of a time where you were younger and life was more simple and you were more innocent back then. And so there's the symbol, the object of your love is right there for everyone to see. Maybe it's your wedding picture. Maybe it's a picture of your kids growing up. But whatever it is, it's in a prominent place. It's on a wall, on a mantle. Maybe it's in your office like it is mine, or maybe it's in your wallet if you still do that. You still have pictures in your wallet. And when you do that, when you have them, when people ask who that is, and even if they don't ask, you ever notice this, you will talk about them. You're proud of them. You show it off to them. You tell them stories about them. And so my question to you is this, is that do you look at God the same way? I'm not asking if you have pictures of God in your wallet. Maybe you do, I don't know. But do you love God enough that like he's something that you talk about? That he's something that you share with others? Someone that you're proud to be associated with? Does God occupy that place and that space in your life that you love him that much? What's your most valuable possession? Maybe it's something that's of great value to you. Maybe it's a a trophy you won or a plaque that you earned. And maybe you were good at sports and your glory days are long past, but you still have on your mantle those trophies. You know, I used to be a really great athlete back in the day. And you show off the trophies and you tell people stories about your glory days and what you used to do. And in some ways you think you can still relive them. Then you're out in the field and you realize that was a really long time ago. It's not the same anymore. But why you're proud of it You show it off, you demonstrate it to others because it means something to you. And other times there's things that are of great value to us, whether it's gold or silver. And we keep that in a special place, don't we? We don't always put those things out, but we put them in a special place and they're hidden deep. And you 
bring them out every so often. I remember when I was getting ready to ask Stephanie to marry me and I was planning on a December proposal for my engagement. But I bought the ring in September and every night I just take it out and look at it just to see it. And I close it up and put it back in the drawer again. Every so often I wanted to like just do it early, but I could recognize I had a plan. You know, I had a plan. And I'm glad I waited for that plan. But it meant a lot. It was valuable to me. It might not, it's not the biggest ring in the world. It wasn't the most special thing in the world to many people. They might even look at it and say, you know, on that youth pastor's salary, it's kind of an extraordinary. Every so often I say to her, you want me to add something to it? Make it more special? She says, no, it's fine as it is. Why? Because it's precious to me, it's precious to her. When it's of value, you keep it somewhere special. You keep it close. My question to you is, where does God occupy the space in your heart? Where does he occupy the space in your life? Is he someone that you are proud to be called a Christian for, that you love him, that you serve him, and that you're willing to give up everything, even if it means ridicule, even if it means that your family shuns you, even if it means that people don't appreciate where you're coming from, is he still worth it to you? Do you still talk about him? Or is he something that you kind of do on the weekends if you happen to have time? So this morning, with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, maybe we can just simply look to the Lord and maybe just be honest with ourselves this morning. My prayer for you today is that this message will have awakened your heart once more to recognize that maybe if your love's grown cold or maybe you've grown distant from the Lord, it's time now to just reaffirm your commitment once again to Jesus. To say, I'm here to follow you, Lord. I'm sorry for the times I've come short and I've fallen away from you, but today I love you and serve you because you mean the world to me. Thank you for what you, you did for me. Thank you for salvation and grace so sweet and refreshing. And I pray today each of us, Lord, would remind ourselves of your goodness and your love. Lord, that you would rekindle the flame that's gone out. I pray right now, God, that we would just put you first in all things and count the cost and that no matter what it costs us, we're willing to pay the price because, Lord, you gave your all for us. So, Lord, I just pray, draw people closer to you, Lord, even now. Even now, God, waken hearts back to you. Draw them close to yourself once again. Have your way in our hearts once again, Lord. We love you. We haven't told you like you deserve to be told. We, we tell you once again, I love you, Lord. I serve you, Lord God. I, it doesn't matter what else is happening in my life right now. What I stand to gain is more than what I could ever possibly lose. Lord, I pray that you would deepen people's commitment to you. That they would be willing to give up all they had for you, Lord God, knowing that you gave all that you were for them. In Jesus' name, amen. You stand with me one more time. Sing that song, See a Victory, one more time. We have victory in Christ today because of his goodness and his love. Before you go, make this your declaration. God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. Say it again. And my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. 
victory for the battle belongs to you Lord. I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages he will win. I'm not backing down from any giant, for I know how this story ends. Yes, I know how this story I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. Yes, you turn it for good. Take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good you turn it for good. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. team. I'm just going to dismiss everybody.